takes a while to get through. Okay. Um, hello and welcome to the Food History Seminar tonight. Um, today we've got Donna Mera, and um, that's right, it's yeah. Mera, yeah, thank you, um, who's speaking tonight on the EU and what EU eats, food and the development of the Eurosceptic argument. Um, you're from Historic England, yeah. and I, I'll leave you to sort of say anything else that you might want to say and um, about sort of yourself as well. But um, um, let's begin. Yeah, um, thank you. So, my name is Don Mara, I'm a, an archaeologist with Historic England. Um, I'm interested in um, food and power and how it works in society. So, this is quite different to my um, day job, but um, a topic that I'm very interested in the role of um, food in political discussion and, and the evolution. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about the role of food in the development of both the um, anti-EEC political position in the 1970s and your sceptic position that grew towards the 2016 referendum in the UK. After a brief, a brief outline of the key events in UK food history in the century before the beginnings of European integration, I'll proceed to highlight the key points of convergence and then divergence, which meant by the 1950s, Britain would become a separate from one particular form of European integration, which did not suit its interests. I will quickly outline the economic shifts of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s in the build up to the 1975 referendum. And after this extremely macro overview, um, which I appreciate, even Fernando Ardell will probably tell me to slow down and be more specific, uh, I will look in more detail as to the rule of food in the 1975 debate and how it influenced both decisions. I will then proceed to discuss the growth of your scepticism to help outline how the Conservative Party went from being strongly behind the EEC membership in the 1970s to its most recent leader announcing his decision to join both the that as a journalist, quote, I informed leaders, I informed readers about the Great War against the British prone cocktail table Christmas. Throughout these political shifts, the role of food in shaping public opinion has been at times to the forefront of all the major debates. Indeed, I would argue that it has been the premier vehicle through which public acceptance of the EEC and then the rejection of the EU has been consistently shaped. Throughout this discussion, I will endeavour to refer to the intergovernmental institutions formed after the Treaty of Rome as the EEC and the institution formed after the passing of the Maastricht Treaty in 1992 as the EU. For easy discussion, I apologise if I inevitably lapse into using the term Europe as a shorthand for both institutions. The 1975 referendum was lost by the anti-EEC position, and the 2016 referendum was won by the anti-EU position. I feel the use of the term you're a sceptic does not fully embrace the political nuance of these sides of the political debate, particularly the strong left-wing position of the anti-EEC campaigners and the strongly right-wing position of the anti-EU campaigners. However, again, for the sake of clarity, I may lapse into generally using the term you're a sceptic in the context by which it's commonly accepted. This is also a discussion of how political opinions form and change over time. It will be argued that the 2016 Remain side did not learn the lessons of the 1975 referendum and did not understand the roots of your scepticism after the formation of the EU in the 1990s. In both of these cases, food plays an important role and it is to this topic that we now turn. In this, I will be dealing specifically with food consumption rather than discussions of production. Therefore, you'll be spared discussions on uh, common fisheries policy and common agricultural policy. I'm sure you will be glad. To understand the role of UK uh, food in UK politics, we need to understand the manner in which the UK used taxation and market controls to influence relationships, relationships with its empire and the needs of the British industrial working class. Of course, no discussion of UK food policy would be complete without a reference to the Corn Laws. These were created as a protectionist measure in 1815 to support agriculture in the UK after the boom years of the Napoleonic War, and in practice supported the interests of landowners. The repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846 split the Conservative Party between those who supported the protectionism of the Corn Laws and those who argued it was anti-free trade and kept food prices artificially high, a key issue for the growing industrial working class and for many of the new electors which were created since the 1832 Great Reform Act. This shift towards repeal, even among some Conservatives, might be best articulated in the earlier words of William Cobbett as, I quote, I defy you to agitate any man with a full stomach. After 1846, maintaining low food prices was as much part of internal security as the Royal Navy was part of the external defence. After the repeal of the Corn Laws, the growth of industry was matched by the decline of agriculture in the overall UK economy, and the UK became ever more reliant on imports. 
This decline in the value of agriculture and the economy, 17% in 1870 and 7% just before the First World War, and the increase in imports also meant that food needs could now be used as a tool of imperial policy. The UK could show imperial preference to its colonies in order to bind them more strongly to the centre of the empire. However, in order to do this, the UK would need to erect trade barriers in order to allow favoured access. And this, is, this has been compared to building a wall in order to then knock holes in it to, to allow access. In the early 20th century, this led to conflict within the Liberal Party, which was also split on the issue of granting home rule to Ireland, leading to a split with those led by Joseph Chamberlain becoming Liberal Unionists and voting with Conservatives. A key issue for the presentation here is that Chamberlain believed the empire needed to be tied together economically in order to preserve its survival and to prevent the dominions splitting away. Opposite, opposition to this position, uh, uh, to, to the idea of imperial preference, argued it placed the burden of cost more heavily on the industrial working class when food was still a key expenditure. Before this uh, issue grew, World War I intervened, but by the 1930s, in the aftermath of the Great Depression, Joseph's son, Neville Chamberlain, pursued his father his father's agenda for imperial preference. By 1931, it had become the policy of the national government. Britain entered and left World War II with a heavy dependence on the Commonwealth for its foreign trade and as an external food source. In the post-war period, this series of imperial preferences were under pressure from a series of economic and political changes. The first was the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, signed in 1947. Britain managed to negotiate exemptions which allowed for favoured treatment of its colonies. But this was undertaken with the opposition of the United States. The opposition of the USA was a feature that would dog the UK attempts to generate support for different forms of European integration not supported by the USA. The second major initiative was the forming, uh, formation of the um, OECD, the Organization for European Economic Cooperation, which was founded to administer Marshall aid. Um, this had the remit to increase European trade and to lower customs barriers amongst members. This would put Britain at odds with the concept of economic union due to the wedge these regulations would create between the UK and its colonies. It's important to remember the UK, um, the UK choice not to sign up for the Treaty of Rome was based on pragmatic economic reality as it was then seen, and Britain was very much supportive of, of other elements of European integrations and led the way on a number of other initiatives, um, including the European Convention for the Protection of Human Rights, a document not fully ratified by France until 1974. The road towards integration, which changed pace significantly in the 1950s. The first sign of this split was the announcement of the Schumann Plan, proposed by the French uh, Foreign Minister Schumann to place French and German coal and steel production under a single high authority. This plan had been approved in advance by the United States, um, a continuous advocate of greater European integration, but was not revealed to the UK government until several hours before it was publicly proposed. It is believed that the UK general election in February 1950 made a strong focus on domestic matters, including rationing, which it's important to remember was still in place at this time, convinced Schumann that the UK would not support the level of integration he envisaged and therefore may have deliberately created a situation which the UK government would not agree to. By the end of the decade, the EEC had been formed and European integration was travelling in the direction we now recognise as the path towards the European Union. In the 1950s, that Britain would choose the Commonwealth over closer integration with its European neighbours seemed like a logical choice. Almost 50% of exports and 50% of imports were with Commonwealth nations. Australia received more British imports than the combined six countries of the European Coal and Steel Treaty. By the time of the Treaty of Rome, the Commonwealth took over 95% of British car exports, 61% of its steel, and over half of its engineering and chemical exports. In the reverse direction, Australia and Canada supplied over 60% uh, of British wheat imports, and Australia and New Zealand supplied over 60% of wheat imports. Britain still relied heavily on the Commonwealth for its food needs, and the European coal and steel community was still many years away from being self-sufficient in food. In this context, a speculative wholesale shift in foreign policy would have been unwise. This position, however, began to change in the 1960s. By the 1960s, the UK traded more with the six countries of the European coal and steel community than with the Commonwealth in its focus on commodities in a global market that was shifting towards manufactured goods, suggested in hindsight it needed to reposition itself. From 1950 to 1970, Britain's share of world exports fell from over 25% to just over 10%, while those of the EEC were rapidly increasing. Though UK uh, GDP rose 80% in the 1960s, those of the EEC rose over 200%. Though it must be borne in mind, the countries of the EEC were starting from a lower base as part of World War Reconstruction, 
This narrowing of the difference between the companies created a political mood which pointed to trends that Britain was losing out. In the words of Conrad Adner, quote, Britain is a rich man who has lost all his property but does not realise it. Two attempts to join the EEC were vetoed by Charles Gaulle in 1961 and 1968, and this has often been interpret, interpreted as de Gaulle's distrust of the UK as a vehicle for US interests. However, it is also likely he was not keen to have the UK join until after the final common agricultural policy negotiations had been agreed. France was in this respect very different from Britain, with a large and influential agricultural sector. Britain finally negotiated, negotiated entry with Ireland and Denmark and joined the EEC on the 1st of January 1973. Thus, another important point to remember, Britain did not vote to enter the EEC, as I have had so many interviews with politicians, they talk about the vote to enter, it was already in the, the EEC by the time of the vote, and the vote was to remain two years after entry, um, as to whether to stay or, or, or to go, And the, which is interesting because um, it, it, it's an example of the fundamental misunderstandings of, of the, that whole period um, among people who were important um, players in the, in the 2016 referendum. The deal arranged by the Conservative government of Ted Heath was opposed by Labour, who pledged to re renegotiate a better deal if returned to power, surprise, surprise, um, or leave with no deal. Of the seven points of opposition which Labour outlined, two dealt with food. One, that Britain would still have access to overseas cheaper foods, and two, that there would be no obligation to put VAT on food. This was essentially inter-party politics in advance of the 1974 general election, and it was stressed by the Labour press team that, quote, bringing down prices for the British housewife was what the public minded about. What could not be predicted, however, was the effect of the oil crisis. With the cost of commodities rising faster outside the EEC than within it, the public mood shifted significantly. This was then compounded by the threat of the reintroduction of sugar rationing in 1974 due to the crisis of global supply. And we should not uh, underestimate the memories of rationing. Um, it, it seems like something very distant and something part of the Second World War, but um, in, in, in context, um, the people in 1974 were closer to the end of sugar rationing than we are to the breakup of the Spice Girls. So that just kind of puts it in, in context. Um, the political discussion shifted from the prices of basic foods to the security and supply of these foods. In 1973, polling was conducted to ask who the public most thought to blame for rising prices. And in 1973, 51% of respondents said membership of the EEC was to blame. Two years later, on the eve of the referendum, this had dropped to 19%. In a significant sh social shift, the numbers blaming the action of trade unions for price increases rose from 25% to 47% across the same period, a hardening of attitude which would be significant in the next decade. Likewise, the economies of the Commonwealth were shifting. Both Australia and New Zealand governments began to favour the UK remaining in the EEC as they saw favour favourable access to the whole of the EEC rather than just the UK. Thus, the 1975 referendum began. Uh, this was the first time a national referendum was held in the UK when the constitutional and political impact of this cannot be overestimated. After much political wrangling, it was decided that uh, two um, independent groups would be formed. The first was Britain and Europe, the Yes or Remain side, and this organisation had the support of the main political parties, as well as the main business and industry lobbies. On the other side of the national referendum campaign, the No or Leave side, this group had significant support from major, significant support from major unions, as well as many Labour MPs, most notably Tony Benn. It was also supported by Ian you know, Powell, the Welsh Scottish Nationalists, and various sectarian groups in Northern Ireland, including uh, the IRA and various uh, lawyers, lawyers, parliamentaries, which probably um, did nothing more than, than push people towards the, the, the Yes side. Um, the campaign itself is now such a strange, um, the tone and the, the nature of the campaign is, is it seems like a, a, it is a different era, it's very, very different. And um, the quotes like um, this one from the Daily Mirror, which is ostensibly left wing, um, it's not something that we would, we would see today in the Daily Mirror. Um, we talked a little bit about the, some of the kind of gender roles in the campaign, and again, it's, it's you could do a whole paper itself on, on gender in the 1975 campaign. Um, 
it's, it's a very different sort of uh, political argument, uh, especially compared to the 2016 uh, campaign. Two of the key arguments of the No campaign were the sovereignty of the UK and the food prices. Enoch Powell, in particular, campaigned vigorously to defend the concept of British sovereignty. Consistently, however, polling suggested that the loss of sovereignty was far less of a concern to the public than the price of food, which was understandable considering the inflation for some commodities was running at 25% ground. Less than 10% of those polled identified food prices specifically as a biggest concern, while um, sorry, less than 10% of those polled identified sovereignty as a key political issue, while 37% identified food prices as their biggest concern. The anti dear food campaign warned that the EEC kept prices artificially high and food prices would increase further after the referendum. This was countered by Sainsbury's and Marks and Spencer, who heavily supported the Yes campaign both financially and by using the consumer magazine to highlight the importance of the EEC as a source of UK food supplies. The Yes campaign created publications such as The Housewife in the Coming Market, and likewise the first pamphlet released by the No side to dealt with rising food prices. This was seen to appeal to women's votes with a strong focus on issues of food prices and household disposable income. In contrast, sovereignty, the balance of trade, and the structure of the EEC favour more a publication aimed at men. This link between food and motherhood was emphasised by a shopping trip to Brussels taken by Barbara Castle, um, one of the most prominent Labour No campaigners. A press conference was convened to compare two baskets of food, which demonstrated how high prices were in the EEC. Um, this was countered by the Yes side, who it would seem had a, had a mole within the No organisation and managed to, they knew this was coming, so they prepared their own uh, press conference to, to counter it. Um, this was countered by the Yes side, who sent an activist to Norway, and in this case they demonstrated that prices might be even higher outside the EEC. This activist was, according to the Times, an attractive secretary. And in reality, uh, this one's Vicky Prankshaw. Uh, she was an advisor to the National Council of Social Services and the Secretary of the Women's European Committee, and published and lectured extensively on the importance of membership. And would, uh, throughout the campaign, she was, um, did become quite frustrated with this, this role of uh, wife and mother rather than um, the professional position that, that, that she occupied. Likewise, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, Thatcher the Milk Snatcher, if you want to talk about that's a whole uh, food history uh, discussion there. Um, likewise, Margaret Thatcher often spoke of as a wife and mother, and there's lots of interviews where she, she'll prefix her opinion by saying, well, as a wife and mother, uh, would often explain the benefits of remaining inside the EEC rather than a, as leader of the Conservative Party. Indeed, wanted to uh, do a whole study on, on the... It, it's a very different political culture, and it's quite interesting, but that, that the importance of this, this as a wife and mother as a political phrase is... is um, was used very, very extensively in, in newspaper interviews and, and in, in the press. This shift in emphasis from food cost to food supply was highlighted with Douglas Jay, a key figure on the North side, as a significant win for the Yes campaign, and one which the North side failed to take the initiative on. He would later say food should have been, quote, the central, if not the only theme of the whole campaign. And this is a quote from uh, Margaret Thatcher, um, again emphasising the, the, the importance of um, um, it was about it wasn't about cost and everything about about securing supply, and thus um, with over two thirds of the vote, the yes side won. Uh, much the, the jubilation of the Sun, the Mail, uh, Telegraph. It's very very different. Again, um, Europe on bust would not be an acceptable phrase now, and equally we would expect to see a, a quote like "We are all Europeans now. Let us make sure we are good Europeans." Now, uh, like the Sun in nineteen seventy five. With over two thirds of the votes, the yes side won, but the food issue was far from resolved. One of the key unresolved issues in the UK was common agricultural policy, an element of the EEC that could not, that could very easily have been the Achilles heel of the yes campaign, had the oil crisis, the sugar rationing, and the shift in global trade not all come to coalesce in the late 1970s. For a country with a continually shrinking agricultural sector, the benefits of the cap were simply not as important to the UK compared to countries such as Denmark, Ireland, and in particular France. The shift in the British economy in the 1980s from heavy industry towards the service industry, the breaking of the trade union influence on the economy, and the encouragement of laissez-faire economics 
created an environment increasingly detached from the 70s with its high unemployment, high inflation, sugar shortages, three-day week and power cuts. Ironically, those who supported remaining within the EEC as a free market defence against the Soviet Union and far left politics now saw it increasingly as a socialist plot. In the reverse side, the anti-EEC sentiment of the left now saw the EEC as the only defence against unfettered market control which characterised the 1980s. And it's to this shift in opinion that we now, we now, uh, we now turn. Uh, these two quotes are, are indicative of that, that shifting opinion. Um, James Goldsmith was a very, very ardent uh, pro-market, pro-EEC campaigner. Um, he, he's probably better known to some people now as a uh, very, very anti-EU campaigner in the uh, in the 1990s. Um, and it's in the late 80s that he had this political shift. Again, we've got a, a young Tony Blair um, expressing Labour policy in the 1980s. Um, well into the 80s, he was drawn from the, from the EEC, was, was part of um, Labour policy. And, Indeed, its current leader probably still holds, um, um, in, in the truth of the term, a sceptical um, uh, view of, of, of um, the EU. Initially, the Conservative Party under Thatcher was supportive of closer integration, and in particular the shift from free trade to the single market. Indeed, the creation of the single market, later a key point of contention for the EU respective position, was driven by Thatcher's government. In this, they wished to break down what they saw as the artificial barriers to trade. And the key event which demonstrated this um, became known as uh, the Cassis de Dijon case. In 1975, the makers of Creme Cassis de Dijon took the German Bundes Monopoly or Volton for Brandtwein, which is the uh, German um, regulator of um, alcohol and liquors, uh, to the European Court of Justice as they prevented Cassis from sold in Germany as it fell below the minimum alcohol requirements for liqueurs. Crem de Cassis won the case and it highlighted many invisible trade barriers that existed between free trade and the single market. And this, the uh, Crem de Cassis case will be, will be highlighted again and again as uh, one of the examples of the invisible trade barriers. There's, again, there's a big difference between free trade and the single market. Um, in, under free trade, com- uh, countries can um, erect artificial barriers to favour their own local industries, so, something like having a, a minimum. Um, level of alcohol for cures or having their own safety standards. Um, there was a worry that um, not having unified single policies would allow protectionism in another form. So uh, this was very much about the factors and the, the, those who supported the single market, what they wanted to um, move towards a single regulated single market. Um, Margaret Thatcher, charged her advisor Arthur Cockfield, was drawing up plans to break down artificial trade barriers. And his 1985 white paper performed the economic argument for the move towards a single unified European market. Despite these advances towards single market integration, a key shift in tone began in the late 1980s, particularly in 1988 when Jacques Delors addressed the Trades Union Congress to defend the role of the EEC. Later that same year, Margaret Thatcher attacked the increasingly expansive and federalist tone of the EEC, and Jack Delors in particular. In what became known as the Bruges speech, she declared, quote, We have not successfully rolled back the state of Britain, only to see them reimposed at a European level with a European super state exercising new dominance in Brussels. Between the Bruges speech and the passing of the Master Treaty in 1992, the Eurosceptic argument which won the 2016 referendum solidified some of its key ideological positions. The EU was now a super state, and one which was a threat to UK sovereignty. It is in this period that the right wing press, particularly titles controlled by Conor Black and later by Rupert Murdoch, began a concerted effort to highlight what they perceived as the ridiculous grasping and global state of the EU bureaucracy with its thousands of nameless and faceless civil servants. During this period, some elements of the press began to highlight the nature of EU rules and how they affected the lives of ordinary people. What is interesting in this context is above all other categories, food and food regulation were consistently highlighted as a vehicle for showing up the EU. From the 1990s, well into the 2000s, food was used consistently to ridicule the bureaucracy of the EU. These stories can broadly be divided into direct attacks or indirect attacks. Indirect attacks at the EU uh, in, in the direct attacks on the EU, a specific regulation is highlighted as a threat to a traditional or triggered item of food. In indirect attacks, the regulation um, is thought of in such a way as to make it affect food in, uh, in such a manner and 
Um, I'll discuss some of these in a minute, but there's a lot of mental gymnastics and um, turning what seems like a perfectly benign rule into something quite, quite threatening. This was not a new tactic, and it was not one um, which was originally preserved in the right. Harold Wilson was fond of the tactic in a manner that would become familiar, familiar in the 21st century. He set up false threats and created false victories in order to claim success in his negotiations with the EEC. Famously, he claimed to have seen off the threat of the Euro beer and the Euro regulations to regulate the production of beer and bread across the EEC. A uh, and, and this was a victory based on um, the work post harmonisation rules, and they were withdrawn long before um, Britain went to enter the EEC. But again, this um, this myth was a persistence. The Euro threat um, has not disappeared, however. The Daily Mail warned of new bread rules in October 1987, though, as I said, such legislation never existed. There was never a plan for, for harmonisation. Um, in terms of um, some of the rules, um, again, there's the direct attacks and the indirect attacks. This is a, a kind of a brief um, chronological um, um, trip through some of those rules. Um, I, I can I can talk about some of them. If, does anyone have any particular favourites? They're a bit baffled by. Um, the, well, as, as it was the first one, we can talk about the Royal Navy Christmas pudding. This was the EU were going to stop the Royal Navy making uh, its traditional Christmas puddings. Again, you think well, how does this um, how does this work? Um, apparently, there's a tradition of the Royal Navy of making a very large Christmas pudding just stirred with an oar. And the EU had planned to um, phase out the use of wooden utensils in commercial food production, which is a perfectly sensible um, kind of for, for food safety. So then you have to think: well, who would use wooden utensils? Um, how might it affect a, a tradition? Um, the, the EU was not going to ban the Navy making Christmas puddings, but you can see how this kind of this step, taking one thing and jumping a few steps, um, and this is a tactic that that's um, um, very very common. Um, Nineteen ninety three, the banning of the clam and sandwich again. You think how could you ban a cheese sandwich? But the issue was um, EU regulations on the correct storage of cheese, and then the argument was well, this means people can't have clam in their lunchbox because it will be stored at the right temperature. Again, that's not complete twisting of the rules. Um, any other uh, jump out is I'm just doing the last one <clears throat> because it wasn't on building up abortions. Yeah, and this was um, specifically in the, in the in the media. It was about the concept that the EU was um, unfairly favouring measuring apple production, and it was forcing UK farmers to grow up apples. Um, this is kind of twisting the, the, the nature of the economic changes in, in apple production. Um, there was no um, economic favouring for, for apple production, um, but shifting costs um, did, did mean that, that um, UK orchids were becoming less productive. In hindsight, that is probably not so good, maybe a diverse, um, from an ecological point of view, but this is due to kind of long term shifts rather than officially policy. It's presented very much as um, an example of, of unfair practices where the EU has picked a region. And is, so, but uh, again, that's, that's, that is a, a real issue, but not one that was directly linked to, to the EC. Um, we've other ones that the no feeding of swans, um, that was to do with how you dispose of. It was an EU directive on disposing of food that was passed the sell by date. So again, you think of like who, what eats food that's passed the sell by date to the swans, the bread, so therefore the EU is buying um, 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 buying the female swan. Um, this, this is quite an interesting one of the, the quote here from the Observer where it appears, which is printed in February 1984. Um, this is quite a strange position, um, I hope you agree. Um, so that the, in the observer, it was acts of kindness, such as feeding stale bread to swans, and bakers and other industries giving leftovers to wildlife charities or to the homeless have been banned by an EC directive. It's just kind of a strange, sure, the homeless deserve fresh food as much as the rest of us. And there's other classic ones as well, but, uh, bending bananas. Uh, mushy peas was not banned on mushy peas, but the uh, directive on the use of food colorings, which again, they decided to go with mushy peas. 
Um, cheese comes up quite a lot. Um, there's a lot of issues on, um, there are EU directives on um, particularly listeria, so making sure that listeria is not present in milk, which is perfectly sent listeria to a big public health risk. This is consistently used to argue that the EU wish to ban um, production of um, cheeses which use unpasteurized milk. Again, it's, it's not true. It's about making sure the milk that's used does not contain uh, listeria. Um, interestingly, the, the Milk Marketing Board, which um, regulated milk production in Britain in the 50s and 60s, well into the 80s, uh, probably did, did more to damage um, um, native, uh, the native cheese industry than, than, than anything the EU ever did. And again, that's a, that's a whole um, other interesting, um, interesting area. Um, again, another classic deceptive one, 1996 mussels. So um, mussels and shellfish are to be given rest breaks and showers. This was the EU directive on the transport of um, animals to slaughterhouses over 50 miles. The logic being that um, mussels are animals, therefore you'd have to give them rest. That, again, the, the directive doesn't cover shellfish. It's for um, domestic, uh, domestic animals. Um, Eurorough comes up again. Uh, Benji Bananas is always, if, if you can't think of anything else, that's always a good one. Uh, cucumbers. Again, th th this is directives over how you classify fruit and vegetables. Um, and the reality is, if you're a commercial unit, you can pack and transport more straight cucumbers than can Benji ones. Um, so the, the industry itself is often leading the way. Often, it's the, it, these these individual industries will request EU directives in order to standardise transport and um, and uh, distribution. Um, but it's always come down. It, it's always presented as a, a kind of um, people sitting around a table in, in, the, in Brussels coming up with something um, ridiculous. Um, other things like brandy butter must be changed the name to brandy spread or fat. But again, that's not true. Um, because that's twisting uh, an EU directive on, on food labelling. Um, cucumbers come up again, well into the 90s. Strawberries. Um, um, the Queen could be forced to make her own dinner, is a pers personal favourite. And again, you kind of think, how could the EU? And again, this is one of those mental gymnastics we really have to think about it. But if you go to the article, it's about the EU. It's not technically food, but it's, 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 it's interesting how they turn something that has nothing to do with food into something to do with food. So the EU working time directive, which limits your working hours per week, so they think, well, what would happen if the Queen asked one of her staff to make her dinner and they said, well, I've already worked my hours, and they all went home, she would be forced to cook her own dinner. And that's, you have to kind of think of a series of steps. But it, it's, it, it has nothing to do with food, but it's been made of food. It's, it's, it's interesting how often there's a concerted effort to, to um, humanise these rules and to try to imagine how they would affect um, individuals. Um, the British breakfast is another, uh, the EU is going to ban um, a fully English breakfast. Again, that's another interesting leap. But it was to do with um, truck drivers would be given because it's uh, long distance truck driving is quite a healthy lifestyle. You're very sedentary, um, working on hours. Uh, there's concerns over um, kind of um, use of uh, drugs and alcohol, um, um, and I'm try essentially trying to. Um, uh, give advice to uh, and to help um, people working in the industry to, to lead healthier lives. Um, so that was taken as instead of a directive on um, education on, on health for um, people working in the transport industry, um, the, the article is fantastic. It talks about um, well, truck drivers about to stop at truck stops, truck stops serve for the English, is therefore the EU wants to ban for English. And it says specifically. And it's going to force them to eat new and croissants. Is again quite nice. Um, again, the the, the the euro sausage is a is a good one. Uh, that was a directive to increase the minimum amount of meat that could be put in a sausage. So that's a directive to say that there has to be at least twenty five percent meat in a sausage. Which is quite low, surely. Um, so that's a directive that would increase the the quality of sausages. But again, it's presented as a threat to to traditional food. Um, leeks, the, the, the leeks on the top, the leeks is a good one. Um, on St. David's Day, the Daily Express ran the story that uh, bureaucrats sparked outrage among the Welsh on St. David's Day yesterday by ordering that all leeks sold in the future must look the same. The, 
the opposite of St. David's Day for political reasons. The, the, the director on leaks goes back to all the other directors on, on, um, on the food production. Um, but again, it seemed like a good way, it was topical St. David's Day, um, link something that has nothing to do with St. David's Day to, to do food. Um, it, it's, and I it must point out a lot of these are totally untrue that EU plan to ban the term mince pie because it's, it's a deceptive term, that's not true. Um, smoky bacon crisps to be banned, that's not true. Um, um, yogurt to become fermented milk because British yogurt is not the same, uh, is made in a different way to, to continental yogurt. Again, it's just simply not, not true. Um, the EU is going to ban off licenses, there'll be no off license sales. If you want to Friday, that's not true. Um, so it, it, you can just see how it's, it's um, sometimes it's about twisting a rule um, and sometimes it's just about effectively making stuff up in you know, um, Bombay next was how to come Mumbai next. <laughs> um, I love it, it, uh, nice, another a good one getting to the heart of, of something very, very traditional. Um, the EU orders just the destruction of WI cakes. Um, this was the idea that because the cakes uh, can make cakes being commercially sold must be stored in a certain way. Um, and so the story ran with the idea of well, after competition, because the cakes hadn't been stored properly, they'd all have to be thrown away. Uh, again, that's, that's not true, but it, it's it's taking a very treasured institution, in this case, the Women's Institute, and um, shoving a, a directive at it to just to, to get an emotional response. Um, eggs can't be sold by the dozen, that's not true. Um, interesting ones like that, um, this is not true, obviously, either. Um, the use of Union Jacks on uh, packets of meat um, to show that they were produced in Britain um, comes up in a few articles. It, it's not true at all, but again, it kind of gets to the heart of, of the EU as attacking, um, uh, as attacking the, the UK. Um, Sunday roasts, as well. again, it's Sunday roasts, they're going to ban um, Sunday roasts again, is it how are they going to do that? Um, it was a link to the EU trying to promote um, greater energy efficiency. So you think, well, what uses a lot of energy? The roasting meat uses a lot of energy. Therefore, the EU, this is through stealth, they're going to do this, the, the cans. Um, so that's, that's, that's a run through. Um, it, you, could, you, could, you could write a whole book on all of these. Uh, but it's interesting that the, the most interesting one is taking something quite innocuous and trying it in such a way to get an emotive reaction. Um, issues of sovereignty are important, but, but if you want to really get a, an emotional reaction, it's, it's things like losing family that, that, will, um, that will really affect people. So to include the build up to the 2016 referendum would be almost re unrecognisable to those who lived in 1975. Instead of sugar rationing, we now have sugar taxes, the sovereignty which Ian Powell campaigned for went from a fringe concern to one of the key elements of the campaign. Now, different types of food policies have come to the fore, and particularly the politics of food banks. It is perhaps testament to the changing global economy and the changes in political discourse that the polit political fulcrum had changed so radically between both referenda. However, when Boris Johnson chose to announce his decision to join World Leave, it was to crumb cocktail crisps rather than the national self-determination they first chose to highlight. And then the, the issue of prawn cocktail crisps was that the EU wanted a single harmonised list of um, flavourings used in snacks that could be available, that would be uh, standardised and made known throughout the whole um, of the, of the EU. Um, the uh, British Civil Servant who prepared the list of snack flavourings for UK forgot prawn cocktail crisps Someone in Brussels said, you've forgotten all cocktails, you should add, add it to the list. But this was this is a story of a British civil servant um, making an error and being corrected by someone in Brussels. Isn't it? But if, if it had remained off the list, it, then it wouldn't have been one of the approved flavours, but it was never on the cards to ban it. It was simply about trying to um, have a clear harmonisation. Um, but it's that's the, that's his first. Um, but the, the, the two things he had as first was the uh, um, the euro condom and pancake crisps. So that's before national self determination was an issue. Um, again, he's trying. It's, it's trying to 
um, he, it's trying to show the, the, the threat of the EU um, while also making it seem a bit silly and a bit ridiculous. Uh, food is an emotional subject and one which can be used to highlight um, very clearly the levels of interference or freedom of the individual. Politicians can often be judged on their ability to name the price of a pint of milk, um, while more recently, a Miliband's struggle with a bacon sandwich may have done more damage to his public image than any of his single act. Nigel Farage is often seen with a pint of Green King beer and uh, not a glass of wine. Uh, and this is just an example of the ways in which people will use food to uh, either attack their opponents or to uh, present a certain image of themselves uh, to the wider public. Britain's relationship with European integration has been closely followed with its relationship to food. Food might now be an indirect concern to debates, but it can still be used to appeal to voters on an emotional level. We may be approaching the era when cheap food, particularly cheap meat, may become a thing of the past. Climate change, energy costs, and international economic and political changes may soon bring food policy back to the fore of political discussions. In the meantime, food can still be used as a metaphor to get the message across. Um, and this was just yesterday from the Conservatives, um, and there's been much parodying of, of uh, this image online. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me, and hopefully it's going to have um, interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone like to ask a question? But was there um, a kind of tipping point when you noticed that the sun, for example, went from being saying that you want good Europeans to having these sun? Um, it was probably 1988, and probably between, if you had to pick a, as narrow a range as possible, it's between um, Jack Delores addressing the TC and uh, the Bruges um, speech by Mark Thatcher. Mm -hmm. That's the that was the point where the left began to not not a big shift, but where it began to think that actually the EEC might be a um, something that um, was acting in its favour. And likewise, it's, it's kind of it's like pushing a tanker. That's the moment where um, the right, particularly the kind of laissez-faire, free market um, element of the Third Party began to think actually this isn't what we, we signed up for. Even though they did a single market, um, the single market required was rule, that rule harmonization so someone in, in southern Italy could trade um, with, with uh, no custom checks, no barriers to trade, um, could trade freedom in somewhere in Denmark or, or, or Ireland. Um, but it's, and as important to remember, market actually was very much the fore of um, the push for the single market. Um, but in between um, um, Arthur Caulfield's white paper in 1985 and 1988, and particularly around the issue of the rebate, which from a, an EU perspective is, is seen as one of the great diplomatic successes that, that she did manage to negotiate that rebate. Um, the rebate was quite, that negotiation, the negotiation was quite bitter. Um, it was successful, which is good, but um, it's that from the TUC conference to the Bruges uh, speech, that's the that's the, the split where they go in different directions. All very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Do you know if any other um, if this sort of alarmist headlines appear in other European nations around their food? I'm not sure. Um, I found one or two. Uh, I don't have the language skills to to look into that. It would be very interesting to look at how. The EU is presented in other countries. Um, certainly in Ireland, I, I don't remember seeing um, when I was growing up. I don't remember seeing those sorts of ridiculous, um, those levels of, of ridiculousness. But then, um, perhaps it could be argued that as a net exporter of food, um, EU food rules are seen as being more important, perhaps to the economy. They perhaps seen as more more logical. Um, but it's it's. There are one or two, um, but it would be, it'd be interesting. That's a whole interesting um, project in itself. But certainly from an Irish perspective, I don't think we've seen that. I've seen a few sort of you know, 
academic articles about the um, Eastern European countries joining yeah. the EU and how they responded to yeah. you know, new foods and, okay. and um, the contrast with their traditional yeah. foods. And, and it was definitely something that people were quite focused on. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, I think the expansion of the EU, especially in 2002, um, the big one of contention is the common agricultural policy, which still mm -hmm. disproportionately benefits the Western European countries and yeah. a country like Poland, which is a big agricultural sector, um, compared to its size, doesn't benefit as much as this country in Western Europe. So I think yeah. the cap has the cap has always been the case here. Yes, uh, I mean the, the cap. I know a little bit about Romania in that regard, where, where where the effect has been to benefit sort of large scale farmers. Yeah, and and this this benefit, as it were, the yeah. the smaller more kind of peasant type yeah. small holdings. Which is um, ironic as the cow yeah. was originally supposed to support the small holdings. Yeah, so I mean it's actually had a counterproductive effect yeah. of, of, of eliminating the, the small local the sort of local food economies yeah. that have, have suffered I, I think. Um, I mean I don't know the about it in detail but yeah. I'm interested in it. Yeah. I, I think um, the agricultural economy has, has shifted so dramatically. Um, even into the fifties the proportions of people working in agriculture in in Sweden, Italy, France, it's still very, very high. It, it's also the, the, one of the one of the elements of CAP was always it wasn't to preserve an aspect of the farmers, it was to support them um, and aid in their retraining. The idea being that the mm -hmm. if you have lots of people working in agriculture those people are needed in industry, so it was always intended to, and this is sometimes misinterpreted, it was always intended to encourage um, greater efficiency to free up people from the land so they would go work in, in industry, essentially. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't to preserve um, the countryside, like, uh, yeah. even though they were the, yes. the original farmers really did Yes. Very but I mean, the cap favours now these days okay. short, short food chains, yeah, definitely. which its yeah. policies have, have the effect of actually um, <coughs> undermining those, those yeah. short food chains in the way it's applied in certain yeah. regions, of, especially Eastern Europe. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's definitely the um, the case here of poor structure. I, think. I mean, one thing I was interested in your talk, and thank you very much. Yes. Um, was that um, the, the sort of reactions were in terms of price and supply of mm. food, and I was wondering also whether um, you know there might, might might have been issues of of quality. I mean, quality and taste seem to be something that comes up a bit in yeah. the current debates around you know the ubiquitous quality of chicken. Yeah. For, oh yeah. For yeah. example, where which is less about supply or price and, and more about the quality of what. Yeah. I think the, the, the quality argument in the 70s almost went the other direction that the Germans and the French and the Belgians were worried about and seeing lots of um, low cocoa, high sugar, British chocolate. So, mm -hmm. um, and the other issue was um, to an extent, the beer is interesting as well because the, the, a lot of that relies on um, the Germans are very strict or there were strict rules on beer production but really they were quite restrictive and that's one of these invisible barriers to, to trade mm -hmm. um the euro beer and the, the, the threat of against the the, the um, british ale was such a big deal in the 70s but ironically due to changing consumer tastes by the early 80s and really was drinking margar anyway mm -hmm. so the, the, the public yeah. voted with their pint glasses um, and, and happily accepted um, yeah. Beer. Um, but yeah the, the quality yeah. issue it, I think sometimes it's forgotten that it really works both ways that that, that um, um, it wasn't Britain it wasn't just Britain being flooded with no mm -hmm. quality products there's a lot of things like yogurt and dairy products and chocolate that European countries um, Again, that's kind of the political you know, defending um, defending native industries. Yeah, and the wooden implement example you gave. Yeah. Um, the um, that 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 came up in Romania as well, where um, the shepherd used to make cheese up oh, in the yeah. mountains in big wooden yeah. bats, and 
um, there was a I think probably they still do it. Yeah. But but it's it's become problematical when it wasn't yeah. before. I, I think a lot of these rules that they would affect you if you're selling your product commercially. Yeah. Um, Which they would be yeah. from that um, And I think that, that that is it's difficult because the, the flip side is that things like hysteria can be a big mm. public health issue. Yeah. Um, it, it does feel very sterile, and, and there was a there was a big um, outcry in the early nineties that the EU enforced the closure of local laboratories. Um, they, they did support the operating of laboratories, and, and um, but perhaps um, smaller laboratories which couldn't um, install the the, um, the new equipment mm. they needed. That they would have been negatively right. affected. But then you have right. to argue in terms of public health and, and also potentially meet the slaughtered in mm-hmm. one country and end up in another. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's difficult because any sort of any sort of rules will affect industries. Um, and if you're on the receiving end, it will seem very very unfair. But yeah. ironically, this began with manufacturers push to blame the third country. But uh, it, yeah. the single market required all sorts of rules and regulation. Yeah, so it's sure. Really, 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 yeah. 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 I don't know whether this is a fair question to ask a historian, but what's your prediction for what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> Assuming uh, that we leave, uh, what does um, that terms? In terms of um, the impact on food, food supply, yeah, food prices, I, I, I food think, standards. I think. Um, I think what this show, what what the what food shows us is it's very unpredictable. Um, the oil crisis effectively came out of nowhere, um, and the um, sugar crisis in the seventies also effectively came out of nowhere. Someone when when Chetty applied to join the the EEC, um, after a year after Britain had been in a year, support for, for the EEC was as low as eighteen percent. So it was seen clear that Britain was going to vote out in, in work after working through negotiation in, in about nine months from, from working up to June 1975, it went from uh, 90%, uh, only 90% in favour of staying to 67% of the state. It was a massive shift because um, there have been reassurances about it. And, and the, the Yes campaign ran a very, very slick, very, very efficient campaign. Um, and the no side. Um, if, if you're on the right, you want to be turned off by Tony Benn, and then you know, Powell was not a perhaps more great vote winner either. But um, I think um, I'm going to back in a bit of story on some events and mm-hmm. say, um, like Donald Rumsfeld's known unknowns, unknown unknowns, unknown unknowns. Um, the next oil crisis, the next oil crisis, we. we can be too complacent in thinking that we can see the way things are going to um, the way things are going to, to pan out. Um, we can suggest lots of different avenues, um, but the one thing that is um, won't change is that Britain is a net importer of food, and securing that supply has not been an issue for forty years, yeah. and arguably it will become an issue. Within ten years, um, whether that's through um, opening the air trade with the EU or from other sources, um, perhaps I, if if I was to predict something, I would say that even the ensuring consistent secure supply of food would be um, an issue that people would take more seriously. Yeah. Which is maybe not Aaron as well. He's a very complacent in thinking that. There was great frustration in my department, at the British Department of Food Policy, that this did not figure more in the campaign, mm. um, despite our best efforts yeah. to publicise it. But um, it was very clear to us going in, or uh, very quickly became clear, that really many of the key participants, the politicians, um, the kind of engineers of, of the campaign on both sides had no understanding mm. of how this, how our food supply worked. Yeah. Um, and therefore, seemed to be astonished and unprepared to the first year. Yeah. And I think it's it's testament to um, 
again, it's one of the, um, the legacies, and I would say a positive legacy of Margaret Thatcher, and something she's not given perhaps due credit for, um, certainly not by the Eurosceptic side, is um, this push towards um, harmonization and the civil market, which perhaps many people complacent about the supply and, and uh, the movement of goods. Um, it's, from a business point of view, it's extremely efficient and was probably just a bit of a shot in the arm to the, the EU. Um, that's not trumpeted as a, as a, a great British diplomatic success. Um, it, it's interesting from from after after the rebate. Um, there's a shift in the media where British politicians and specifically British prime ministers are judged in how they deal with the EU. The, the, the EU is something to be kind of um, it's quite a combative relationship. So your success in dealing with the EU. So Gordon Brown keeping Britain out of the European Union. Countries. The comments might be pros and cons, but what we can see is that the British press um, saw that as him fighting off mm. another assault by, by the invader, mm. uh, and that, that theme of resisting resistance and uh, um, and and battle is one that comes up a lot. You give lots of plentiful examples of these tricks and new stories mm. over decades. How, how successful was anybody at kind of disarming them? Because they're, they're kind of very similar. They you take an idea and then you twist it. Yeah. But is there much of a push? Is anybody interested in that? So, so you, the European Commission is, um, unfortunately, it's probably not very good at promoting it, it's, it's, um, it, itself. Unfortunately, there's, there's probably not the same uh, market for corrections and clarifications than there is for because some of the stories are they're funny, they're they also feed into the fear that most people have. And, and uh, some of the journalists including our, our current prime minister, um, they went to the EU the EU as it was formed in the in the nineties, um, a place that journalists didn't it wasn't an exciting place. It, it was um, the, the information coming from Brussels was very worthy and, and um, technically important, but it wasn't exciting. And there is a class of journalists um, who, and, and it's been commented by, by various EU officials that, that in particular, um, certain journalists um, for, for the UK papers um, were almost competing with each other to, to make um, the the institution seemed ridiculous. There's one, um, I can't remember his name, there's a quote from the EU official who invited um, a prominent pub, a prominent journalist, and I don't want to name him because he was him, but uh, to their house, which was a normal suburb with a, they had a garden, it was just a normal house in, in Brussels, and this was written up as um, extremely palatial, and he felt quite Angry that that he invited this person in good faith with some others, and then he it's described as a it's practically a castle. In, in, but um, there was almost as a sense of, of, of fun with that. It, it does precipitate um, the kind of um, national populist idea of um, kind of pushing the lie and, and don't just double down. Um, if someone corrects you, you can just say, oh, well, I made a mistake, and, and just press on. So I think um, that's, that style of doing politics is going to feature quite heavily in the 2016 campaign. And we could argue, we see the roots of this here, this idea that, well, to get to it, the important thing is getting your point across. It's not about the dry technical detail, it's just pushing on and double down if you're a challenge somewhere. And indeed, people don't seem to be very interested in the technical detail. No, really. no. Which is, which is frustrating because actually, if you look into where some of these rules come from, they, on, the, on the outside it does seem a bit ridiculous, well you want to regulate cucumbers and bananas, um, but really it's about um, fair and equal trade across, mm -hmm. across the continent of, of uh, how yeah. many of people and, yeah. and what someone in Southern Italy regards as Certain quality of the cucumber, but mm -hmm. which is Britain, people have different ideas. Um, so, arguably, that there is going to be 
you could be arguing there is some point of some wastage there as well. Um, but you're dealing with an industrialized food system where um, it, it very much encourages standardization. Um, and you could argue that there are, that there are big issues with that. Um, there will be issues with food waste, um, which, which does need to be tackled. And certainly that's, um, it's not, it's by no means a, a perfect system. But um, yeah, when you're really dealing with hundreds and hundreds of people, it's, um, it's remarkably difficult. I think we forget how efficient it is considering it is dozens of languages and hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, uh, and, I, and I think um, also the supermarkets are part of the driver of yeah. standardisation, aren't they? So often yeah. the standardisation that gets attributed to the EU is actually a different yeah. source. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and there are other models of food distribution. Uh, I've seen I've seen a, an example in, in Paris. There's a, a system where um, people... I can't remember the technical details. It's, it's, it's people are given vans with a very low... Kind of uh, given a loan where they can get a van to then drive around Paris uh, with these mobile, mobile, mobile grocery vans essentially, and then park up outside of apartment at a certain time. And so they'll go on the outskirts of Paris, they'll buy off vegetables from the producers, drive them into Paris, and and people really buy into that um, because it's a different sort of food culture, I guess. Um, yeah. the, the style of if you go to supermarkets, so if you compare a, a German supermarket with a, with a UK supermarket, the, the, the choice in, in the UK is vast, um, where you would have multiple versions of the same product. Um, if you go to Germany, I always have the sense of there is much more limited choice. When people don't want to find different types of peanut butter, they just. Okay. Yeah, which I, which I think is interesting. I think people haven't really looked at that as a factor of European food culture. Um, choice, to, to, uh, what people regard as choice. Um, in Britain, it's very much um, more products uh, from different brands. Um, this is quite different. I always thought it was quite different in Europe. So. What about sort of other kind of media? Because you mainly talk about newspapers, what, what sort of big television or um, sort of news. Sort of sites like that, but also sort of things like social media, Twitter, and so forth. Yeah. The later part of this period, yeah, because so that's where reactions will also be in yeah. different ways of looking at this. So I, I was I was specifically interested in um, print media, yeah. and it's a bit of a cup of it's quite easy to sure. trawl through that. Um, where you would start with social media? Um, yeah, that is a perennial yeah. question. Yeah. It's yeah. always yeah. a yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. It's, it's it's interesting, um, but. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a big problem. Um, I've not really looked at. I think one of the issues with with uh, broadcast media is, um, especially for example, BBC, and, and, and choice is a bit more restricted, I guess, in the nineties. Um, but um, um, broadcast media have to adhere to quite much stricter standards. Um, that said, that you you will have some. Um, Korean people like in Gus and um, Peter Hitchens to an extent, although I think he doesn't really, he, he tends to focus on the issue of sovereignty. But then you see someone like um, uh, Robert will, 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 will focus on um, <coughs> the kind of bureaucracy. Um, uh, but that's, that, uh, I suppose, in his defense, he, he's focused <coughs> on critique of bureaucracy generally. Um, but broadcast media have not. Uh, focus on so much, but, but certainly in in the public imagination, ben, you say Benny Ben Ben is there. Yeah. The, yeah. So. Well, the, another just sort of and again, another bit into that is sort of, of course, Weatherspoon has been quite vocal in the, yeah. this campaign, but in a quite, quite a slightly different way than most sort yeah. of have been. Have you looked at sort of their magazines and things like that? Because no. they said different things about yeah. this whole thing as well, which I is think, quite Eurosceptic generally as well. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um, um, yeah, to, to, to Martin's interesting. Um, his shares have fallen a lot. Yes, I see. Um, it's, it's almost as if I'm, I'm not an economist, but apparently, if you, if you tell half the, the country to, um, they don't like that. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, he's promoted as he, he's, he's promoted um, uh, English Spark and Wine and. and Again, in his defence, which is, is, is an important. You, you can argue about the 
their their um they can model but um they promote they're the people one of the biggest promoters of all British ales um in terms of food um you can look at their I don't know a lot about their their distribution and production. I I'm gonna take a leap and say that food is not prepared from scratch <laughs> in, uh, in the so again that's a that's a quite a different model to um perhaps other restaurants. Yeah. Um but but um his argument is right back to the corn laws about we need to get rid of regulation mm-hmm. and get it's about cheap food. We can buy it from wherever we want and the world can trade with us. And um it's almost a, it's almost a cliche but the the decision the the, the, the appeal of the corn laws um have, still affects our view of what what we want cheap food that's easily available. That's the key. And um, it's very different to um um let's say France or, or let's say in Ireland where um cheap food is seen as what cheap food means um is only cutting into farmers' incomes. So um yeah, and, so the quality itself I've talked about more, I think. Yeah, I think so. And and Germany arguably accepted the cap knowing it would be paying more for food because it would tie itself to France. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a different way of looking at it. Um, the corn laws still. Yeah, still, still, still there. Yeah. So it's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Peel is, yeah. Well, the peel is, is uh, looking down and saying, I was right. So. I just looked up by the screen screen supplier. Um, <laughs> they they do it by breaks and they are a UK company, which I'm quite surprised oh, about great. actually. Yeah. Um I thought that they might have been using a larger company considering oh, yeah. no, the think, price of that. Yeah, I think I think it's a very tight um tight controlled system. But whereas now a lot of companies now are, are um especially in London will have um, even even um, um, especially to the room, that's a whole other talk. Um, you have these centralised production um, warehouses where you have multi- multiple companies based, and they're all be preparing food that's then shipped out to, um, and then kind of um, there's a, a last level of production in the restaurants. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a different, uh, different model of that. But, um, but I think that the main thrust of Tim Martin is, and I remember Tim Martin doesn't, he has a, a large chunk of those things, but he's not a shareholder. Um, but certainly his big argument was about get rid of, get rid of, switch that. And it's about cheap food for the masses. Which is, yeah. Can I ask another sort of yeah. little silly question? I couldn't work out what sort of microscopic grain of Truth, if you even want to call it that, was in the off licenses being barred, the Sun article oh, from Monday to Friday. That was about so. um, um, the E promoting um, um, alcohol brands. But so it's, it's totally untrue, it is absolutely no. But the, the thing was, the, the, like, again, I'll, I, people forget, people think of bureaucrats in the room, but the any of these things come from suggestions from member countries that's put to the Commission who then decides whether to progress it um, to um, um, to progress it further or to do studies. And so then you can have studies or reports that will never become um, legislation but um, um, it's simply a study that's not done. Um, alcohol consumption is a public health concern. The EU had looked into it. Um, they, they were they were looking at harmonizing drink driving levels. Um, and um, again, this is presented as as this like it, it was an attack on it was presented as an attack on binge drinking, as if that's it's not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> but it's it's um yeah, sometimes these harmonisation rules they, they they have the they can be spun as as this great powerful super state and dominating their lives. But the the, the off licenses were. It's just made up. It's, it's like saying you can't sell eggs, but it doesn't. It's, there's nowhere it says that, but just throw it in. Um, it kind of reminds me of 
I think it's yes, Prime Minister. There's yeah. the, 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 the sausage, and I can't remember what they call it, but the sort of joke on all this yeah. stuff shows just sort of in that period sort of how how common that kind of yeah, yeah. silliness was. Yeah, yeah, I and mean, I think um, it's also, um, I suppose people just weren't used to those kind of rules because um, arguably the 70s is a huge shift in the food industry where um, top is that harmonization, um, which if, if you're in the industry, um, to know that the these are the, the, the rules for food you're producing, and if you follow these rules, you can sell to a market of now 500 million people. Um, from an industrial point of view, the industry, the industry is often the ones who are leading the way and asking for this legislation so they can move the range of these markets. But of course, it's going to be right before um, that parity. Nobody complains about the standardization of uh, medical devices or um, child car seats. Um, but then even as it, just, it makes it seem ridiculous, um, which, is, which is the point, I guess. So. Do you ever think about why food, I mean, obviously food is ubiquitous, but why food was the chosen instrument of uh, a few skepticism, as you say, why it was you know, used by these agents to make everyone hate the EU? I think because um, it's very personal um, and you can, it's something people engage with on a daily basis, physically. So you, you talk about um, changes to financial regulations, you can talk about interest rates, you can talk about um, European Monetary Fund policy, you can talk about um, um, the, um, industrial safety, health and safety, uh, but that just doesn't affect mm -hmm. many people, um, and those kind of things do seem um, sensible. Um, that, uh, Except they, they did manage to attack um, was an EU directive on safe working around pressurised uh, pressurised um, containers, which again, if you work in an industry like the gas industry, um, that's very important. You would think, especially when you've got the gas around in Europe, and rather than concentrate on the directive, which is to protect the workers working in, in environments where pressurised gas is stored, they focused on the effect it would have on the train. Um, enthusiasts who would need to get, and they said they'll all have to pay for gas fitters to check their engines and do the new and new other train. Yes. But again, it's ridiculous. But I think food, because, and, and if you're not involved in the industry, um, it, it, perhaps you would say, and if you're not involved in food production and then you become so divorced from food production, you would think, well, why, why do you need to? To have all to come straight, or well, why should apples be divided into these sizes? And, um, and because everybody we eat bananas, and we, we um, these are all foods that we're um, we commonly engage with. It, it, it's never, it's never. I'm sure there's directives if you look at there might be directives on caviar storage, and I'm sure there's ones on. Um, all the directions on champagne production, but they never focus on those. Mm -hmm. They never focus on. They focus on. It's all staples: um, crisps, uh, bananas, apples, cheese. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, because you need to make it personal, because then people begin to develop a sense of um, they make the food that you want, which which you could argue then is a very deliberate. It's not extending, and it's not parody. You're choosing. Um, choosing things that will, make it, that will invoke bafflement and confusion and anger. Any final question? The English sparkling wine producers, yeah. um, I'm presuming that they were happy um, to have Mr. Weatherspoons, which yeah. I know right now I've forgotten, um, prom promote their product because I suppose the Weatherspoons brand image will be reflected on their wine for a large quantity yeah. of time. And they, they were happy. Yeah, I presume so. Um, I, you can get into debates about the nature of um, that brand. Um, as in, we all know brands are can be quite fickle, 
and often things are enacted towards a certain it, it can affect you how things are enacted um, towards um, and the what they call the perception. So you might want to kind of think of your project in one way. Um, it's sometimes difficult to know how people will, will take it in another way. Um, so the beer Stella Artois, the ads are very sophisticated and it's everybody professional you know, uh, while having a great time. That's not maybe the public perception of Stella Artois. Um, so yeah, I think I think, I think um, becoming popular with a certain industry can be a double-edged uh, sword. It, it means you may also tie yourself to that industry and in, in a in a in a business that's suffered a share decline of twenty percent since the referendum. And also, what when when they decide they want to market themselves in Europe, um, there could be issues there. I, I, it's not an industry I'm familiar with, but um, yeah, I think I think there are shorter benefits and long term question marks about any sort of. Um, okay. Well. Um, so I'd say thank you for the talk and it's a round of applause. Yeah. Um, we usually go downstairs to the common room for um I'll just send me a young stream. Um for